We're back. And we're here with David Weber, whose latest book in the Honorverse, Storm from the Shadows, is in bookstores now. David, welcome back to the show. Thank you. And welcome back to our first opportunity to talk about the Honorverse. That's right. We were talking about something else the last time. We I were talking there. about something remarkable and mm -hmm. entertaining and continuing, mm -hmm. but the Honorverse is this huge, massive thing that you've created that just kind of looms over the horizon of everything else. Yeah, it kind of got bigger than I really expected it to. I was originally, when I started the series, I'd only projected about five to eight books. And I think I'm now up to like 14 or 15. And my best estimate is that there's five to 10 still to go. So, minimum. so you were approaching it like a Solarian League admiral evaluating the Manticore Navy. <laughs> well, kind of, yeah. <laughs> Except that for them, it's going to be shorter than what they had in mind. You know, yeah. There are some similarities there. Now we are in. When I say we're in the universe, this mm -hmm. the the central character. Uh, although to call her a central character is, with the wealth of characters that you populate your novels with, is possibly simplifying it too much. Mm -hmm. Is. Uh, is Admiral Michelle Henke, mm -hmm. Mike, Henke. Mike yes. who uh, who was honors bunkmate uh, at school, mm -hmm. and uh, is closely aligned to the ruling family. Mm -hmm. uh, She's fifth in line for the crown. And you kind of, as a way of tying the story together and keeping everything in its place in the timeline, review some of the elements that have occurred in some of the previous books that brought her to the position she is in where she mm -hmm. is no longer able to engage in direct combat against Haven. Yeah. Well, for the most part, um, we review past events, but we do it from a different perspective. Uh, scenes that we saw from Honor's perspective, we see this time from right. Mike's perspective. Right. Um, and scenes that the reader knows happened, but we didn't see at all in the previous book. We see in this one. That's all in the first three or four chapters, and mm -hmm. there's 30-odd chapters in the book. So it, it is another one of your small novelettes. Oh, one of my small books, yes. Um, but as you say, the function is primarily to put down uh, a time-ranging stake so that the reader knows where these events occur in relationship to ones that have already occurred and they'll be able to tell in relationship to events that are going to occur in other books. The, the timing situation has gotten a lot more complex. Oh gosh, I wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> yeah, well, um, the, the previous books were really about a fairly straightforward war. And from this point on, the real villain is beginning to emerge from the shadows, hence the title, Storm from the Shadows. Um, and the entire environment, how many people I have to keep track of, how many star nations I have to keep track of, has gotten a lot more complex. You know, I wondered about that as an old Coastie. I, I was wondering if you have kind of like a billet listing board all the way across one wall so you can just track who's currently assigned to which vessels that are still operational, considering the carnage that occurs, uh, so that you can just see who's dying, who's living, and who's moving up the ladder. Well, actually, what I have right this minute is a very, very detailed timeline on which these events take place and occur. And what I can do is a global search when I need to find out you know, who's where or whatever, usually starting from the back and working forward. I, Excuse me. <clears throat> I've always kept uh, a timeline of major events, but now I'm keeping a timeline where it says, like, dispatch boat arrives from Manticore, links Talbot, and gives the date, and, yeah, and then dispatch boat arrives, uh, spindle from the links terminus, etc., so that I can keep things straight while working in areas that might be six, seven hundred light years away and keep the timing where I need it to be. Readers will also probably note that there are more hard and fast specific dates given in the text in this book and the ones that are going to follow. Let's talk about a couple of things in the book that, that I think really are, are quite interesting. One of the things is uh, that is really is a big focus in this book that wasn't necessarily a focus in the books where we were talking about maneuvers and, and large fleet combat is the lag time in communications throughout the, throughout mm -hmm. the human occupied universe. Mm -hmm. uh, the limitations that places on decision making mm -hmm. and how it can have the unfortunate consequence of people having to make very important, critical, apocalyptic decisions 
without all the information yeah. that they might like to have. Yeah, well that's always actually been a factor in the books. What's happened is that because of the nature of the decisions that are having to be made now, the impact of the time delay is greater. Um, when you were already at war with someone and the question is, do I attack now or not? Mm -hmm. It's really an incremental problem. But when you're not at war with somebody and the question is, should I attack them because of what they've done or not? Mm -hmm. It's a change in kind. It's not an incremental situation. And being inside somebody else's communication and decision loop both gives you enormous advantages and creates disadvantages because your opponent, not having that access to that information, can't make fully informed decisions. So you may know that what they're about to do is a really, really big mistake, but they don't. And it's going to have consequences for both sides if they do it. Do you find it uh, enjoyable to explore that dilemma because you do it quite effectively in some of the some of the scenes between people who are trying to determine which way they want to take mm -hmm. the strategy for their for their star mm -hmm. cluster for their planet uh, as they move through this rather prickly thistle bush yes. that, that you place them in yeah um, I wouldn't say that it's something that I specifically set out to do so much as it is a, an irremovable part of the matrix in which these characters have to operate. And so as a storyteller, I have to allow for it. And the consequences of it sort of exert themselves on the storyline. I, I need to look at this and say, okay, this is the information that you know, Joe Blow has. What decision is he going to make? And then the implications that arise from that and how the other people around are going to react to it really structure themselves because I know the characters, I know the information they had at the beginning of the decision tree, and I know, therefore, how they're going to respond. But it is, it is I have to admit, uh, n knowing that one of my major decision makers is aware of the limitations and is thinking about them and so forth, to me, that's a significant part of what makes them a major decision maker and that gives the weight to the decisions that they're making. The decision itself is irreversible. You can't change it. You can't take it back once you've acted in accordance with it. But you're doing it on the basis of your last information, your understanding of your orders and the policy of your, your nation, and hoping that there haven't been events back home that mean that what you're doing is now exactly the wrong thing. Right. And I think that what does sort of, um, uh, if not amuse or entertain me about it, but one of the things that makes this a focal point in what I'm doing, is that we are now so accustomed to instantaneous communication that it really is hard to remember that up until, oh, 80 years ago, you didn't have instant communication. It would take days for news to get from some parts of the planet to other parts of the planet. Um, and so it is a contrast between the operating environment of the characters and our own experience that I do think uh, is significant and which sometimes I deliberately underscore. Well, and, and what, I, what I really enjoy about it is, is it lets us rather quickly become acquainted with a, a large cast of characters. You've effectively used this in many instances as a way of introducing who they are, how they think, where they are placed within, and I can only call this the vast conspiracy that is essentially unmasked in this mm -hmm. novel. It is a critical novel to understand what's going to happen in the universe over the next six, seven, eight, nine, whatever oh, many books. Absolutely. Well, initially, I, Honor was supposed to be killed and at all costs. I wanted to get yes. to that because that's been a subject of a great deal of discussion yes. on your uh, website. When, in my original projection of the storyline, Honor was supposed to die at what became the Battle of Manticore. But she was already supposed to have had her son and her daughter 
and then the story was going to pick up 20 or 30 years further down the road. I decided to do two subsidiary series, one starting with Crown of Slaves, my collaboration with Eric Flint, and one starting with The Shadow of Saganami, which sets up the confrontation in the Talbot Cluster between, Tal between Manticore and, and Mesa. And I was going to bring them forward and use them for, to cover the interval between while Haven and, and Manticore settle down from an uneasy peace to actual trading partners and all the rest of it. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, and I personally think it was fortunately, um, when Eric and I did Crown of Slaves and when he did some short fiction that he did, he pulled that portion of the plot forward about 25 or 30 years without my noticing that we'd done it. And all of a sudden, there wasn't going to be time for Honor's kids to grow up. Mm -hmm. And so, with enormous regret, because I hadn't realized how much I was going to like the character when I was originally planning to kill her off, um, I had to give her a reprieve. And Oh, I was broken hearted, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, but initially, what was supposed to happen is her and Alistair McKean's roles were, were flipped. Mm -hmm. um, and Alistair finds out that she's trapped on the bridge, she's mortally wounded, she's in her skin suit, but the bridge has lost pressure, they can't get her out of the wreckage. If they can't get her out of her skin suit, they can't treat the wound, they can't pressurize the bridge, so right. she knows she's dying. And the last thing that she says is for Alistair to tell the queen, for God's sake, let it end here. And Elizabeth is so stunned by what's happened and by Honor's death that she goes ahead and reopens negotiations with Haven and a peace is signed. Well, when I determined that I couldn't kill her off. Because you didn't have anybody to carry the story. I didn't have anybody to carry the storyline on. Now, and I will confess that there were other factors involved. As I say, I had originally only projected five to eight books in the entire series, and I think this is like number 14 or 15. Give or um, take. A one give or, or take, you know, plus the short fiction. I, I hadn't realized the readership that she was going to have, how detailed the honor verse was going to get, and how much I was going to like her. And so I really was unhappy about the thought of killing her off in the first place, but I can be stubborn, and that was what I had planned to do, so I was going to do it until I realized that, gosh darn, Eric had left me no choice but to change my mind and do what I really wanted to do, which was to keep her alive. But it also affected my plans for those two secondary series. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing instead is there are no secondary series now. They're all mainstream Honor books. And Honor will appear in most of them here or there. But what's actually happening is we're kind of advancing on a broad front now. So this is, despite the title, despite the fact that it's called Storm from the Shadows and that it is the sequel to Shadow Saganami, it's also the direct sequel to At All Costs. And so will be Torch of Freedom, which is the sequel to Crown of Slaves. It will also be the direct sequel to At All Costs when it comes out. Right. And then Mission of Honor, which has already been completed and turned in, but can't come out until after Torch of Freedom, will then take both of those sequels and move the entire storyline a little further down the line. You've, you've, you, in, in just that one statement, you've excited, you've calmed and excited an entire cadre of readers. <laughs> because she's not going to die, and there's already three more books in the bin, well, and everybody's very happy about it. Well, that. she didn't die. That doesn't necessarily... Well, she isn't going to die right now. No, not know? right now, okay. no. Uh, you know, I, oddly enough, what you said there about deciding it was time is kind of echoes what the leader of the Mesa conspiracy says in this book. Mm -hmm. Well, we weren't planning on doing it this early, but things have kind of presented themselves, so what the hell? Yeah, well, and that's exactly what had happened to them, too, <laughs> you know. Um, and I'm like, well, I, I find myself in agreement with Albrecht, you know. <laughs> it's like, it was very strange, a little disconcerting. But it really is, um, because other events had not moved forward. Okay, just what had happened in the Crown of Slaves and the, the, from the Highlands and whatnot, what had happened was stuff had come forward that I couldn't stop and turn around. Okay, and that meant that I really had to stop and look at where I was in the series and say, okay, what does everybody do now? Not just me as the writer. What do the characters have to do because of the changed context against which they were making their plans? What I like about it is, and I don't think I'm giving too much away of the contents of this book, 
is that you've turned a whole new light on the Solarian League. Rather than this rather monolithic wall off to the side mm -hmm. that, that reflected the light of the battles between Haven and Manticore, mm -hmm. you have now taken a very close look at their social structure, mm -hmm. at their cultural structure, at their political structure, at their technological expertise, and in one specific chapter in this book, at the potential fault lines in that social construct mm -hmm. that could be exploited by a number of potential actors mm -hmm. that you've introduced to us. Well, and see, that was always part of the, of the game plan as well. But again, I'd actually intended to start bringing the Solarian League a little bit forward sooner than this. Uh, so that the reader would be introduced a little bit more gradually than they are. Um, but then everything got kind of pulled forward. So I had to give you more uh, and more quickly about the Solarian League than I'd originally anticipated doing. Uh, initially, what I was thinking is you would meet some of the main actors and mm -hmm. they would be having their assumptions about how stable and strong the system is. And it would only be a couple of books later, maybe, that people began to realize that, wait, there are problems here that the guys at the top don't see. All right, But because of the way that the, that the situation got accelerated, it's not that the people who see them wouldn't have seen them anyway. It's just that I give it to you a little bit sooner so that as you meet the Solarian League, you already know about the fault lines. Right, yeah. right. When we talked last, you had taken a break from the universe. You mm -hmm. said that you needed to do that to establish a perspective. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're hip deep back into it. I mean, you're still exploring your other stories, but mm -hmm. you're, are you having fun? I am having fun. I think that um, at all costs uh, profited from my taking a while away from the series. And I think that doing the safe hold books with Tor um, helped to give me sort of a, a mental rest mm -hmm. from the honor verse. And another factor was simply that I did have to recalculate where I was and sit down and really think about how is the storyline going to change. And so it got me kind of uh, excited again, and I was approaching characters uh, uh, with a freshness that you don't get if what you do is book in the series, book in the series, book in the series, book in the series. Um, I've been pleased with most of the honor books. I've been more pleased with some than with others. Um, you know, you, 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 do, you don't hit a home run or a double, you know, every time you come to right. the plate. I haven't felt that any of them were strikeouts either, you understand, yes, but some of, of them I've liked better than others. Um, the last three that I've written, which would be at all costs this one and Mission of Honor, I think are three of the strongest books in the entire series to date. Um, well, I know that they've grabbed me, and I know that I'm looking forward to the next one, and the next one, and thank you. the next one. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we've run out of time again. Oh, darn. And we haven't. Oh, it's very frustrating, mm. but that just means that hopefully the next time you're in the area of promoting your book, we can have you come by and we'll have another conversation. I'd love to. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest. We hope you come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Shad saying, take care.